Thank you, Alex. Um, if anybody at the back would like a seat, there are seven or eight empty chairs up here if anybody would like to come forward uh, and have a seat. Um, Alex and Nigel have touched on the fact that um, there does need to be housing in this district, and I think that's very important, and I hope that you will agree that you know, we cannot, I believe, put our heads in the sand and argue that there should be no housing development. Our issue is about how and where housing is developed, and that's really the nub of all this. Um, the council will come up with what they call their spatial strategy. It's a planning term, but basically it means where the houses are going to go. And there were, as, as Alex said, back in 2015, a number of approaches looked at. And they included building all the housing in the existing towns and, and, and villages, and, but primarily in the urban areas. Um, and then there was this almost footnote about this new community. They have decided, the council has decided to turn their back on developing more houses in urban areas which are arguably more sustainable. Towns like Oxted and Caterham, which have already significant infrastructure. They've turned their back on the opportunity to build at higher densities. Now we're not talking about tower blocks, we're simply talking about building two, three bed terrace semi-detached houses instead of large four, five bed executive homes. The council is actually obliged under the national planning policy to look at all these options before they then go to look into release greenbelt, and they failed to do that. So one of our key arguments will be to an inspector that actually they haven't followed the letter of the law, they haven't followed government guidance on how housing should be allocated, and it's actually unnecessary, as Alex said, to argue the need for this huge development. The council claim that the reason for having a huge development in one place is because it is so massive and the numbers attached to it are so huge that they will be able to extract from the developers hundreds and hundreds of millions of pounds to pay for all this wonderful infrastructure that they argue will benefit the wider district. But that's not actually the case. Their own documents very clearly show that they expect the development to produce 110 million pounds from the developers through what are called SIL, Community Infrastructure Levy, and Section 106 monies. But their own documents also show that the garden community will cost at least £350 million. And that's with some major elements like a relief road and flood risk not even costed yet. So there's an enormous funding gap. So it's disingenuous for them to tell us that the garden community is self-financing. It's also disingenuous to suggest that the wider district will benefit from the infrastructure that will come with it, because actually they can't even afford to pay for the infrastructure that the garden community itself will need. So what is, what is TNAC's strategy? I think it's really important for us to be clear on what we are arguing. Um, we call it a layered approach. So first of all we look at the numbers, and some of you will be aware that originally the council was saying that the housing number would need to be 9,400. That's what's called the OAN, it's the Objectively Assessed Need, which is a number that comes up through a standard formula that government provides. And the council argued for quite a long time that this is what they were being told by government they had to deliver. After pressure from people like us and others, they have actually reduced that number now to about 6,100. And that's what the council are arguing they think they can deliver. There are some people who think that number should be even lower, and, I, um, and for example, OLRG, we know will be arguing for a lower number still. Um, it's a very, very technical area, and we, TBAC, have decided not to challenge that number. Um, it's quite arbitrary in the way that the council have arrived at it, but given that it's one third below where they started, and I think being realistic, given that we know developers will be arguing for a much higher number, We've decided that in our representations we're going to accept that number, we're not going to condone it as such, but we're not going to argue against it or try and reduce the number even further. What we're doing instead is we're then looking, as I said, at where the housing should go and what is the right strategy for delivering housing. And we will be pointing to the fact that the Council's own documents make it very clear 
that those 6,100 homes could be delivered without the need for a garden village. We will then also argue why it is fundamentally inappropriate and unsustainable for a garden village to be located at South Godston or indeed Blindly Heath, because we know Taylor Whitby will still be coming forward and arguing that theirs is the better site. And the proposal to put a garden community at South Godston contravenes a huge number of areas of national planning policy. Um, we think that they have undoubtedly skew the evidence to fit their strategy. As Alex said, they decided a long time ago what they wanted to do and in fact where they wanted this garden village to be. So the last year's consultation was a sham. They were only ever going to put it here and they tried to make the evidence fit that decision. Whether it's the impact on highways, on uh, landscape and openness of the Greenbelt, the Greenbelt purposes, uh, ecology, uh, and other areas, we think we can take this uh, proposal apart and a huge amount of our arguments will be focused on that. There is then a final format position which I accept is perhaps controversial and not everyone may agree with it, but our thinking is that in a scenario next year where a government inspector sits at the local plan inquiry and possibly says I can see what's happened here, I don't particularly like the process or where you've got to, but I find the proposal and the strategy for a garden community to be a sound one. We're then stuck in a situation where possibly there has to be a garden community somewhere. In that scenario, all the evidence we've looked at points to the fact that the Red Hill Aerodrome site is actually much more appropriate, much more sustainable. It is in the Greenbelt, same as South Godston, but half of it is what's called previously developed land or brownfield land. The impact on flood risk is a lot less, the impact on ecology is a lot less. There are much better prospects for employment and jobs over there. The benefits to the East Surrey Hospital will be greater, there will be direct access from the M23. It's a much, much more sustainable location. I know some people will say, over my dead body, I don't want to see a garden community anywhere in the district, and I would respect and understand that. But I think it is, also, it is an important part of our argument, and it's the final part of our argument, that in a worst case scenario, if there has to be a garden village somewhere, which we don't think is necessary, then that is a better location. And that's not just being a NIMBY, that's based on the objective evidence that, that sits in front of us. Um, those of you who are on our database and receive our emails will have seen all the letters we've written to the council over the recent months. We tried very hard to influence their thinking. Uh, I'd like to think that that was partly um, resulted in the lower number of houses. But equally, we can see that they haven't really changed strategic direction. The previous consultations, like the Garden Village consultation last year, they totally ignored the evidence that came out of that. It was a whitewash. We've analysed every single one of those comments. There are only 5% of comments in favour of a garden village, and yet if you read their report, you would think that opinion was evenly divided, and there were as many people for it as there were against it. It's absolute rubbish. That will be going into our response as well. Um, we have spent an enormous amount of time and money now preparing our response, and that is the TLAG response, so that is effectively on behalf of all of you. Uh, and that will go in by the 10th of September. We have a town planning consultants, we have a Queen's Council, a QC, highways consultants, ecology consultant, landscape consultant, and we've done a huge amount of work ourselves as well. The, the bill for that is adding up and there's an enormous amount of money and we do still need more money to help pay for those costs and Nigel will say something more about that at the end. But I'm confident that what we submit by the 10th of September will be an incredibly robust and well-argued well case against these proposals. So why is it important for you all to respond if we're doing that on your behalf? Well, the inspector who will sit in the inquiry next year does get to see everybody's submissions, everybody's objections. Anything that you have written in about in the past will not be seen. Okay? It's really important to understand 
that even if you've written in two, three, four times, that is all under the desk now, it will not go in front of the inspector. So it's fundamentally important that you all write in again, 